Welcome to Numerical Methods. And we are in a new chapter. Yeah, So we started discussing the Monte Carlo method. So now I like to define the Monte Carlo integral and we have a similar code session and we will implement it. So here is my definition of a Monte Carlo integral given say a function from the unit cube zero one to the power of d to the real number. We consider um, a sequence of d dimensional vector valued iid random variables having uniform distribution on this cube. And then we call one divided by n, take the sum of f of xi from i running from one to n, and we call this the Monte Carlo approximation of the integral f of x dx over that d dimensional cube yeah, with n sample points. There was, there's a subtle yeah, uh, modification. When I started the motivation, uh, actually I was just saying that we had this little lemma for functions f mapping from r to r. And there's a subtle modif modification. I consider here a function that lives on the d-dimensional cube. Yeah, so the function f is defined on, um, uh, has a, a d-dimensional argument um, vector. Yeah? So, so we already moved here to high-dimensional integrals. So there appears to be a strong restriction. We are restricted here on the interval from zero to one. Yeah. So this is a restriction to a very special domain. So I only can approximate these uh, integrals on these domains, but uh, you can of course uh, express integrals over other domains by yeah, the rule of substitution, the transformation rule. So for example, if you have a one dimensional integral and you like to integrate from A to B, yeah, then of course you can just use the transformation U is A plus X times B minus A, yeah, like we used in the discretization yeah, with the Simpsons rule. And then you get the integral over the domain zero one. Of course, you get an additional factor here in front. Yeah, so don't, don't forget this factor then. If you are in D dimensions, yeah, there is of course also the ability to transform this. So you need a function G that transforms this unit cube <clears throat> to the desired domain. And then you get the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobi matrix, yeah? so of the derivative of this uh, function yeah, instead of this factor, yeah, so this factor in front there corresponds here to this, this part here from the Jacobi, with the Jacobi matrix. Uh, maybe it's not possible to find such a function, but it's sufficient to have a function that transforms the domain in a way such that it is contained in this cube, yeah, because if you just have a set that is contained in this cube, then you can express an integral over this set by an integral over this cube and multiplied with the indicator function on this uh, this set. Yeah, so there are a lot of possibilities to ensure that in the end, you actually just consider here the integral over this domain. Okay, so for the one dimensional Monte Carlo integral, it means I just evaluate uh, the function on a random sequence. The code is very short, and this here is also the code with Java streams. Yeah, maybe I can show you this implementation in a separate session. Let's just implement the Monte Carlo integral. So implement the Monte Carlo integral, of course, means that I now apply 
a single event to our sequence of IID random variables such that the XI becomes a sequence of uniform distributed random numbers. So I need a random number generator for this uh, that generates now um, the the little xi's here. So I need a random number sequence, and we will discuss random number generation yeah in the next chapter. So just use that as a black box. Just use that as given. Let's implement the Monte Carlo integrator. So of course, I also like to use my interface. So I create a new class. The class should implement my integrator 1D interface and I call it Monte Carlo integrator, uh, say 1D, it only makes the one dimensional integral. Yeah, I need to implement this method here. What are the properties of my class? Uh, Okay, that depends now. But of course, also I need the number of evaluation points. Uh, no, let's take integer number of evaluation points. So how many points do we like to use for the approximation? Then you could also say you like to implement this with a general um random number generator yeah so something that provides you this sequence yeah maybe we can do this then the object here is a double supplier yeah and this is the uniform random number generator that we need as an input to this. Uh, so for the question, what is a double supplier? If you look at double supplier, double supplier is just an interface that tells you this guy provides you with a sequence of floating point doubles. Yeah, So you can ask get as double and you get a floating point double. And if you ask next time, you get the next one. So this is just something that provides me a sequence. Okay, so I have these two inputs. Yeah, how many points do I like to use from that sequence? And what is the guy that provides this sequence? Once I have this, uh, let's create now the constructor. And once I have this, I can now implement my Monte Carlo integration. Yeah, what do I need to do? Let's calculate the sum over all those function evaluations. So I now run I from zero to number of evaluation points. Yeah, and then I just do take the next random number, evaluate your function on this argument, sum up all those values, sum up all the function evaluations. So here, of course, I need to ask get as double. So this gives me the next random number from my sequence, evaluate the function on this random number, sum up all those guys, and then I return sum divided by the number of function evaluations. Yeah, so I divide here by this. So that's it. That's the implementation of this guy. Uh, well, not completely because um, this is just the rule that I have to use if I integrate from zero to one. Yeah? I have to respect here my arguments. So I need to apply the transformation, but the transformation is that lower bound so maybe I do that here. Yeah, so this here is just the random number. And my argument is the lower bound plus the random number multiplied with the domain size. Yeah, where the domain size is upper bound minus lower bound. 
So that's my transformation, yeah, which is actually here, which I'm now doing. Okay, and in the end, I have then, because I made the substitution, I have to multiply with the domain size. So this is this part here. Yeah, this should be my Monte Carlo integrator. If you say, for example, compare this code here to the Simpsons integrator, yeah, you see it's shorter and it's much less involved, yeah, much less complicated uh, stuff. Yeah, easy to implement and simple. Let's check my Monte Carlo integrator. And now there comes a funny thing. Yeah, I also like to teach you programming. Um, a good style is programming against an interface. Well, here I have my integrator, but on the left-hand side, I could just say that this is not of type Simpsons integrator 1D. I could say that this is just a general integrator. And what you see is that my interface is defined in such a way that the only thing that I need is this function integrate here, that all the code that is below here still works. Yeah? So he doesn't care if it is a Simpsons integrator. He only needs to know that it is some integrator that provides this function. So I just have that guy now on the left-hand side. So now I can just replace my Simpsons integrator here with my Monte Carlo integrator. Yeah, I need an uh, additional argument for this guy. I need an argument, the double supplier, the random number generator. Okay, so you can now uh, use different random number generators. Uh, I have one, the Mersenne and Twister, yeah, which I will also mention in our section on random number generators. So maybe we can use this. So this is my uniform random number generator. So let's use a new Mersenne twister and you can provide an argument that is the random number seed. Okay, yeah, just use the random number generator um, as, as a black, black box. Let's run my experiment. Okay, so we get a similar value that looks nice. The error is, yeah, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two. Okay, so we have 10, 100, three. Now uh, we have a 10 to the five here. So I would expect something like uh, a one divided by 10 to the power of two half, 2.5. So maybe I take 10 to the power of two, 10 to the power of four here. Uh, so I get a 10 to the power of minus two in the error. Uh, so let's add two zeros. So multiply with a 10 to the power of two. Then I would expect since I have convergence order one divided by square root of n that I get an additional digit here. Yeah, that's the case. Yeah, So I have an additional uh, and let multiply with 100 again. Mm, now it takes a bit of time. A 10 to the minus four. Yeah? I have a 10 to the minus four, four, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a 10 to the eight of number of points. So you see that um, your um, integrator is, um, also working. Maybe I make this experiment here a little bit nicer. Yeah. So I create here, say, a new method that is called test integrator. And I just pass the integrator to this. And in this method, I just copy all this code here that was below. Okay. So, because now I can test my Monte Carlo integrator. So this here is my integrator Monte Carlo. 
And I can also test my Simpsons integrator with the same number of evaluation points. Uh, so maybe I make this a constant. So I can pass that in here and I can pass it in here. So I can now call this test here again with my Simpsons integrator, integrator Simpsons. So you see the nice thing is that this integration here, this test here uh, is written completely independent of whatever implementation we inject. Yeah, So this is a little bit dependency injection and you can now, oops, run both. Yeah. Okay, my Simpsons guy has, um, the requirement that the number of evaluation points needs to be odd. The Monte Carlo does not have this requirement. Yeah? So it's, uh, I, I, got, I got this exception. Maybe I also print which integrator was used. Well, the funny thing is this guy doesn't know yeah, actually which integrator is passed in, but I can check this. Yeah? So I can print here the integrator Give me the class, yeah, and from that class, I would like to have the name. And then he will also print which integrator uh, was used. So you see, the Simpsons guy is really much better compared to the Monte Carlo uh, one, two, uh, 10 to the minus three, much better, yeah, but the code is more involved. I already spoiled yeah, that we have an convergence rate one divided by square root of the number of evaluation points. Yeah, We tried that just out here by increasing the number of evaluation points. And we saw whenever we uh, multiply with a 10 to the power of two, yeah, we improve with a 10 to the power of one in, in the error. Um, I already spoiled this, but of course I have to derive my Monte Carlo convergence rate. So what is now my Monte Carlo integral convergence rate? What do we get? And now I also solve this little subtle modification that we have here. The generalization, I consider a function that is defined on 0, 1 to the power of d that is defined on a d-dimensional cube. Yeah, we are already in d-dimension. What I have is that we have for any delta larger than zero, this gives me here, well, because everything is still in probability, yeah, this gives me my reliability of this estimate. I have that my Monte Carlo integral differs from the true integral just by, so I can estimate it with the variance divided by square root of this delta divided by square root of the number of evaluation points. Yeah, this is just our Monte Carlo estimate Yeah, because this guy here is the expectation of f of x, x being uniform, on 0, 1 to the power of d. And this guy here is just my Monte Carlo integral. Huh? Of course, I just get the same estimate. And now there is a really nice thing on the dimension. Note that we consider here the general case of a d-dimensional integral. And the thing is, the D does not appear in this error estimate. Okay, search for the D, there is no D. Yeah? There is a D, of course, here, because you say, I like to calculate a D-dimensional integral, but this guy here is just evaluate the sum on this D-dimensional random variable. Okay, this d-dimensional random variable here is a vector 
containing D one-dimensional random variables. Generating this is populate the vector one element by the other. No? So now, very important, recall what we had in this session, how you generate a sample of a vector. You just take the one-dimensional sequence and you just populate the guys one by the other. So having here a vector no, uh, of a random variable with uniform distributed entries component just means that it scales linear in the dimension. You just need in your random number sequence, you just need to sample D random numbers to populate this. So this scales It's linear in D. Compare this now to the Simpsons rule where we had five points in one dimension and then we needed five times five. Yeah? It scales exponentially in D. So why is there no D in this error estimate? Yeah, Why is there no to the power of one divided by two D here? Yeah? So why is there no D in the in the error estimate? Do you know this? The thing is, because this error estimate is operating on the image space. Yeah. It is, it doesn't even know what, what are the arguments of F. It is saying that this is a one dimensional sequence of random variables. Yeah. And this is an expectation in one dimension because my function is mapping to R. The method is looking at what is happening on the image space. And that's a bit different to what a classical integration rule does. There you estimate the age, and this is a property of the structure in the domain space. So this is why Monte Carlo breaks this curse of dimension, yeah, because it is looking at the image space. And we have more interpretation uh, later. So, how do we prove this? Yeah, of course, our little lemma holds, and there's also the thing with the um, dimension. Again, our little lemma 22, yeah, that the function f applied to a sequence of IID random variables, it holds also on RD. So I have the function here from RD to R. So if xi is now a sequence of IID random variables, then zi being f of xi is also a sequence of iid random variables. So I can use now the z in my Monte Carlo error estimate and note that z lives in R. It doesn't even know anything about the dimension. Yeah, this is just a summary of what I have explained to you. Yeah, so there are many interesting aspects here with our error estimate and the dimension. The generation of the random number sequence scales linear in the dimension. It's just filling up this vector. So what we have uh, seen in this little picture, and this is also associated with what is a drawing and how do we model a drawing? A drawing is already a point in a high dimensional space. Yeah? So doing um, a drawing of a two dimensional vector yeah, or doing two drawings of a one dimensional um, element isn't a, a difference, is, is not a difference from the modeling perspective. Note the difference to the Simpsons rule yeah, where we have a scaling in the number of points to the power of D. You can generalize this to yeah, the uh, L2 norm, this estimate, okay. And here is another nice experiment. Uh, maybe you can try this uh, at home. Yeah? I did sometimes this session where you can approximate P yeah, by actually integrating the unit circle. So you have a two dimensional integral. So you are already getting two dimensional. And then you just count, you know, are you say inside the unit cube? This is just check the condition X 
squared or x1 squared plus x2 squared is smaller than one. So you just count, are you inside or are you maybe outside? Okay, and then you can calculate the area of the sky and from that you can have, you have an approximation of P, yeah, the area is uh, for, for P. Um, you see that actually what you do is you calculate the ratio of the points that fall inside, yeah, divided by the points that you sample. Here is the corresponding experiment, yeah, which you can try out and here is some code. You see that what we do here is really uh, we populate this two-dimensional vector by drawing two random numbers. Yeah, So here I use math.random. I draw two random numbers who populate the vector x, y and have one sample point in my two-dimensional space. And I calculate just the integral. Okay, in the script, you find this small excursion on working with schemes. So this is just one slide, yeah, what is this Java stream in case you like to implement this other, uh, yeah, implement or use this other implementation of the Monte Carlo integral and the um, Simpsons integrator. Okay, so maybe uh, we can skip that. And then we have now a code session, but we already did this while doing the lecture. So code session, Monte Carlo integration, given a function, implement an interface and provide a Monte Carlo integrator, our Monte Carlo integrator 1D, which we did in our code session and implement a Simpsons rule integrator by implementing this very nice general interface here. And that was, what we just did. Yeah? And you can find this again in our lecture repository. Sometimes I do different implementations with streams, without streams, and so on. You can peek into our repository and you can find the implementation of this guy there. So we already did our code session. And let me yeah, conclude again with this remark. If we compare Monte Carlo integration with um, a classical integration. So um, the biggest advantage, and that's all, yeah, that, that's why this method yeah, is so important in many applications is that it is independent of the dimension. And this being independent of the dimension not only means that we have yeah, a decent convergence rate in very high dimensions where other methods yeah, are becoming very slow. It also um, is an advantage from the implementation side yeah, because he doesn't care if your function has a complicated domain uh, on uh, in, in, in high dimensions, you just need to sum up the function evaluations and constructing the integration rule in higher dimensions for, yeah, say such a structured rule, like for example, the Simpsons rule is quite complicated. Yeah? You can try as an ex exercise, implement the Simpsons rule in say D dimensions yeah, and mm, ah, the code becomes already a little bit uh, involved. Another advantage of the Monte Carlo method is to improve the accuracy by just adding another Monte Carlo approximation. Yeah. So if you have two independent random number sequences, you can calculate a Monte Carlo approximation with one of these sequences. And if that is maybe not accurate enough, you can calculate another one and take the average of the two. Yeah? So this is for a classical integration rule, usually not possible. I mean, if you use the Simpsons rule with five points, yeah, discretize the interval using five points, and then you use the Simpsons rule with five points again, uh, you get two times the same in, uh, integral value. Also, if you like to switch from say, for example, three points 
to five points, these are, except for the endpoints, completely different points. Yeah. Except for the endpoint and the middle point, right? Yeah. So there are only a few points that you can reuse, but except yeah, adding more points is really an F effort. For the Monte Carlo method, adding more points yeah, is not an effort. The disadvantage, again and again, this remark uh, is that convergence holds only in probability, but we will see actually in the next uh, session that uh, this is um, a feature and not a bug. Uh, this is actually something that enables this independence of the dimension and um, we can fix it. With respect to my second advantage, which uh, I mentioned, this averaging of two independent Monte Carlo approximation. Of course, this is also the advantage that allows us to parallelize yeah, uh, this calculation. We can distribute different Monte Carlo integrators. They just need to be uh, sure that they have independent sequences. Yeah? They could start with a different seed, whatever, and they can calculate approximations. And then we average these approximations, which becomes a better um, approximation. So for example, for this, and then we are done. Um, if you have the two integrations roles, so here you have, for example, Simpsons, and here you have Monte Carlo, then with the Simpsons role, you have that point, that point, then we have this guy, this guy. So now for the Monte Carlo five points, Okay, so now with Simpsons, if you like to move to seven points, yeah, there are a few points that you can reuse. But now we are going like that. Okay, so you see that um, the structure changes by adding more points significantly. Yeah, so some guys get different weights. Yeah, so you have to correct some weights. Yeah, and some points. Uh, actually here missing uh, while other points uh, are added. Yeah? So for the Monte Carlo, adding more points is just a trivial exercise. So you just copy this here and you add your additional points. Say one here, one here. So that's also uh, an advantage of this method. Yeah? So this simplicity uh, is really, really helpful. My last section in the chapter on the Monte Carlo method is now giving you some intuition why actually the Monte Carlo method has this property that uh, the convergence is independent of the dimension and why this probabilistic nature is yeah, contributing to this. And then we will continue with the random number generation, which we need for the Monte Carlo method. But let's do that next time. That was it for today. Thanks.